Hello, and welcome to Navigating Su Success. I'm Jeff Carlton, Certified Focal Point Business and Executive Coach. And welcome to episode 30, a little bit of a milepost uh, on our journey as we explore uh, other people's business journeys. And I'm extremely excited to once again have somebody from my original state of Wyoming joining me. This is James Childress, CPA, who has found himself a, a little bit of a blue ocean, or at least a niche market uh, for what he does with CAC Advisors. So I'm going to let kick it over and let James tell us about CAC Advisors. And uh, we're going to explore how he transitioned and, and, uh, and how he got there. So James, welcome, sir. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Jeff, and appreciate you having me on. Um, so the work we do is based in my experience as a CPA for about 20 years. Unlike most CPAs, I did not immediately dive into a specialty like audit or tax. I spent a lot of time working for small business with small accounting firms and running my own for quite some time. So a lot of background that's really holistic in business. And I've seen a lot of business owners over many, many years. And so our work is helping business owners succeed to accomplish what they want to with their business, which is very specific. It's not just about more money, but we also help them accomplish profitability and growth and reduce their committed time into the business. And we do this with a variety of different tools and a variety of different skill sets and experience gained over uh, uh, many, many years in the trenches with business owners. All right. Uh, my video connection got a little unstable there, but um you specifically are in the mental health you you specifically try and help mental health providers correct yeah we we do we do work with all types of businesses but in our marketing we're very much pushing into that niche and we chose that niche because i have a background personally in therapy and i gained some incredible insights by working with a therapist for many years and I value that. And we've worked with practice owners for several years now. And it really is a space where they need a lot of support and help. It's actually a, kind of a booming industry for them. And there's a lot of demand for their skill set. And so the demand for them internally on the business side is also very significant. Um, if, so this is a loaded question. I don't want you to, I don't want you to dime anybody out or anything, but do you find that they're not prepared for running a business? Oh, it's 100% the case. And, you know, so I went to the American Psychology Association conference in August and walked around and just tried to make connections and meet people. I was actually considering whether this niche was something we really wanted to go into 100%. And everyone I spoke with, you know, said, I, you know, when I introduced myself, kind of a fish out of water in, in that world. But I said what I what I my background was and what I do, and almost you know nine times out of ten, if not more, they raise their hands up and they go, "Oh my gosh, we need that," <laughs> because really all over the place that type of support is something they don't get, and even the typical software products that they use, like an electronic health record, things like that, they don't actually even receive training like in those things, and so. A lot of the practical side is 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 absent in when they start an actual business. Yeah. Right. So yeah. let's let's help frame it up because I I understand what you do, but I don't know that we've we've set it um, here for the for the content for people watching. You specifically help them with their financial side, with their accounting, their billing. Um, give us a little bit clearer picture of what exactly. Um, you do for these providers? Sure. Yeah. So the work we do is very much laser focused on them having the right profitability, the right growth track to accomplish what the owner wants and for the practice to be stable. I very much have the long view for the practice. It's very common for the practice owners to have sort of a, a short-term view. They're looking at the way the clinic is right now, what's going on right in front of them. We help them create the plans and, and plan out the resource development so the practice can be everything they want it to be. And so our uh, focus you, you in that area. Right, strategic planning. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that's what we do. 
as yeah. opposed to uh, day to day reactionary operations. So, um, which is a, a, exactly what I try and get people to do as well in in all elements of their business. So I, I really like that. So you you have a fairly long without without calling you old because I know I am a little bit older than. Um, <laughs> Um, you have a pretty long resume of uh, CPA experience. What sparked you into closing down the CPA side um, and and doing books for people and tax prep to um, going into a consultancy kind of role? Yeah, so for many years, uh we we did kind of all things i did all things because working for small firms most of my career they always cross train everyone's doing a little bit of everything it's just the way it is in a small firm and i was i was that way for quite a long time about seven years ago i decided i wanted to focus in i was doing some audit work doing actually a whole lot of that as well as, as everything else decided to get rid of the audit work because i wanted to focus in and actually help clients with some of the problems that, that I was telling them they had. And then after many years, I decided, again, I didn't really want to focus in on tax. Um, it really wasn't an area that I really was building a significant skill set in. Um, and I wanted to sort of let the experts handle the tax. And as time went on, I realized I had a knack for communicating this information. And I was pretty empathetic and compassionate towards the entrepreneurial journey and so, uh, again, refining the focus so that we could work closely when we accomplish what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah, and it reminds me of something that somebody once told me, be careful what you're good at, right? Because um, you might get trapped in doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. Uh, some some things come easier than others, and the, some that come easy may not be what you want to do for decades. <laughs> So, right. yeah, well, and, and and if it's not something you enjoy, then you won't do it. Um, so you said we, um, how big is CAC? Yeah, so about two years ago, our, we had a team of about 18 people. Um, oh, wow. So we'd grown significantly um, through COVID and after that. But now there's three of us. Again, in, in the interest of refining our focus, I asked other members of my team to sort of take ownership of parts of the business and kind of split off. And then of course, eventually last year, we sold a significant aspect of the business, which was all the traditional work that was left. And so- All, yeah. all of the accounting side, the bookkeeping. The yeah, the yeah, the stuff. accounting side and, and you know, a lot of the compliance stuff, you know, we did a lot of grant work, did a lot of tax work. And so, yeah, we, we refined our focus even more. So that, that is a um, departure from, I think it's the first time I've had somebody describe downsizing as a huge success because you really begin in the value of becoming laser focused on um, one specific element of what you were doing instead of trying to do all of these things all at once. And you chose the thing that you like and the thing that you're good at. Mm -hmm. um, so what has been the impact and what has been the profitability and the, um, the what are the good parts and the bad parts of having done them? Yeah, so every client carries a certain level of customization, but when you focus your offering, that amount of customization becomes more uh, easier to utilize for other clients. So if you narrow your focus for what your offering is, then you have fewer things that apply less to all these broad people. So in a service-based uh, area like we are in, um, there's always going to be sort of the one-off thing for this client or that client. But if you narrow your focus, the, the customization for each client becomes a little bit less of the job because you expand things and you have tools that you create for yourself that allows you to be more efficient. So as an example, we, we have some tools we use to apply cost accounting principles to our clients financial information because we specifically do that now most accountants are able to do that they they learn it in college so they, you know they're very comfortable with those 
those things. But if they're not doing it all the time, their production of that type of thing is relatively inefficient or it can be. And so for us, we gain a lot of efficiencies and it, it really does show with how our organization runs. It's a lot more streamlined. So what is the impact on your clients of coming and, and helping them through? This is kind of your chance to say what, what what happens uh, what what happens when they work with James and CAC yeah so what they should feel is a much more confident early in our work with them they'll feel much more confident that there's a plan in place and the plan is something they can achieve a lot of business owners and you might relate to this Jeff and you've probably seen Very it much. i know where you're going so i can't, but i'm going to let you say it no, no, no. It's it's so easy to feel stuck. It's so easy to feel like this is the only way things are going to be. And you're just kind of in this rut day in, day out. We really do appreciate the opportunity to work with business owners and show them a path away from the immense overwhelm of 100 hour weeks, um, away from the overwhelm of, of tight, tight cash flows, really a path forward to get them out of the situation they've been in. So that's the first thing we like to work with the client is to give them that confidence and to give them a reliable, reasonable path to accomplish what they really want. No, uh, I like that. So you talked about the pandemic and, um, it, and that's had significant impact because remote accounting was kind of a thing before remote everything else was a thing because of QuickBooks Online. Yeah. Um, yeah. QBO was around before um, other remote work was. So the accounting space was well positioned. Um, nobody else was. Um, so having that background, are you leveraging that to work with you? Do you work locally or do you work nationally? Yeah, it's kind of odd. We brought on a client in uh, Seattle of about a month ago. And we already had one in Long Island. So I get to say to everyone that we are coast to coast now. Um, oh, but yeah, very truly, uh, our space is truly one that's that's entirely virtual and works in the cloud. Um, even after COVID, one of the interesting things was I had clients in the same city that we just no longer met in person anymore, just right. because there was no need to even travel 10 minutes to and from, you know, a client engagement. So yeah. Well, and, it, and it's interesting that you say that because I have found um, since I started doing um, virtual engagements as well, it's more than just 10 minutes of travel. Yeah. It's 10 minutes of shutdown and put a coat on and brush the snow off the windshield or put sunscreen mm -hmm. on depending on what season it is and, um, and, and travel to the location, set up. Everybody's used to working on multiple screens now, mm -hmm. and everybody's trying to share one screen. It's kind of like watching a little kid's soccer game. You got 10 kids on the field, and there's only one toy, so it just turns into a scrum. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, how long, what is the span of engagement with your client base? I mean, do you, you come in for a short period of time and work with them and then step away or is it a long-term engagement? What's your model? Sure. Yeah. You know, some clients need a little bit more support than others, but we will start off all of our kind of main, you know, our, our typical work. We're going to start it off with a planning engagement. And that means that's where we meet with the client, figure out what they want to accomplish. We put together a real grounded and clear plan and, and forecast along that, along that plan to help them chart their course and give them some key objectives to achieve on an annual basis, quarterly basis, and even into the next month. So that's kind of our initial kickoff. It usually encourages the client to start thinking into the future more. And as they say in the military, Jeff, which you're probably familiar with, no plan ever survives first contact with the enemy, right? So <laughs> uh, that's why we would all or spouses or children. Oh, watch out. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's why we would also uh, work with them if they're interested in a monthly engagement to sort of nurture that plan, make sure the month to month objectives and the changes that need to take place are there. We really want them to understand 
what is the biggest challenge right now for the business and give them the tools they need or help them find the tools they need to work month to month and make sure they stay on track. So that's that's typically how it works. And we use a lot of different tools to accomplish that. So um, what is your plan? I'll, I'll, I'll put you on the spot a little bit for this one. Where do you see CAC in 12 months or 36 months? Um, yeah, so in 12 months, we want to get our full roster clients. And for us, that's somewhere between 20 and 30 clients, you know, depending on the size of the individual client and the activity there. And we're well on our way. We've got a lot going on. Um, we've done a lot of successful things in our marketing. I've been presenting at some conferences, and I'll have some more that I'm going to be doing this year. Um, attended another podcast specifically in our target market. So that's our goal. And three years, I think three years from now, we're going to probably work on some of our smaller tier offerings a little bit more, trying to make some of the things more accessible to a broader basic client that might be more in the area of the solo practitioner realm or more in the area of someone who's solo and wants to start a group practice. So that's going to be a big focus for us. But it's, it's good, though. You've got a plan, which uh, puts you in the... Uh top two percentile because a, a lot of people don't um if you could change one thing today about uh about your business and what you were doing what would it be oh one thing today change about the business um you know i i would i would probably wish we had even more visibility i think the only real constraint we have right now is our market uh, awareness, you know, the market being aware that we are available to them and we can help. Uh, but we're making inroads there. Uh, but if we were sort of a nationally known organization, um, we'd really be able to tailor everything we're doing to the ideal client and make sure they got what they needed. So right away. Yeah. Awesome. Any, uh, any nuggets of wisdom from going I mean, you jumped out of working for other companies um, under their umbrella to go and, yep, I'm going to do my own thing. Um, what what were some of your biggest speed bumps or what advice would you give somebody that's considering doing what you did and starting, spinning off and starting your own business? Yeah, um, I think the biggest thing that I would advise everyone to be very aware of is be very clear on what your expectations are. Um, a quote I'd heard is that unspoken expectations are planned resentments. And so when you think about employees, when you wow. think about outside vendors, even when you think about customers, be very clear on what you expect from these relationships, what you want the end result of all of you working together to be and really be sure to hold people accountable. It's the best thing you can do to help them succeed is make sure they know what it is you expect. That's, I love that. Um, um, unplanned expect or <laughs> expectations become planned resentments. That's, uh, I, I, I really like that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to use that. Um, you copied me on the beard, so I'm going to copy you on the, uh, the the planned resentments. That's a brilliant. That's a brilliant. Sure, and, and, and like it's that. not mine. It's actually a quote from uh, Neil Strauss. He's a writer, and uh, oh. yeah, he said, Un "Uncommunicated expectations are planned resentments." So, well, that's fantastic. Um, well, James, that kind of kind of puts us uh, at the end of our time. Um, this has been an awesome conversation. You're uh, you're a great guy with uh, high intentions and doing great things for people. Um, your expectations are obviously quite clear. Any parting shots before we say goodbye? Um, you know, I think I like to sh I like to share with people the definition of the word entrepreneur. Um, because if you look up the etymology of the word, it's actually three words: entre, meaning between. Pren, meaning to hold, and er, meaning someone who, as in like user, someone who uses. So an entrepreneur is actually someone who holds between. And it's a very appropriate term for that space. And I would just encourage everyone who is an entrepreneur, move to where they're an owner, try to get as many things off their plate as early as possible. 
that is a that's often been a theme of of the series of um, you know when you're not good at something hire somebody who's better at it than you are and get it off your plate so that you can be the business owner. Um, Excellent. Yeah. And I appreciate that. That's good. Well, uh, James, thank you for joining me, and for everybody watching uh, this episode number thirty. I sure hope you enjoyed it, and I look forward to the next thirty. So we'll sign off from here. Take care.